Mark Quadra, you come up with a brilliant tweet referring to the Rusty Gate competition. Sorry, I've got a lot of squeaker here. You said the huge response to this and amount of subscribers you've got now has really brought home how much competition there is out there. Could be worthy of a future topic. Let's get you just uh, you've got a wet tummy, haven't you? A little piggy tummy. Oh, that's better. Actually, this has been something that's been on my mind for the last couple of years with this vlog of coming clean of what the opportunities are, say, for example, when you leave music college or studying uh, a media composition course. You know, what are the odds? And the reason why I've skirted around it is I've never wanted this vlog to become of those oh, ain't like the old days. The old days when there was like 10 session musicians. I don't know, it reminds me of uh, someone talking about the Paleolithic diet. You know, we should all have the Paleolithic diet. It's like what, when people had an average kind of lifespan of 18 years. I think we all hark back to a halcyon day that never really existed. There's always hierarchies. And to my mind, musicians have always been pretty poor, but, I think I do have something to offer here because I, in this rare kind of uh, a position of also being a founder of Spitfire Audio and having a real idea of what the metrics are on numbers of people who are wanting to do the job that we do. See, Paul and I, when we started out with Spitfire, we were very nervous about chucking the towel in as composers, taking our feet off that gas pedal because we were pretty certain that at any point, unannounced, we were gonna run out of customers. Indeed, I remember going over to Los Angeles to see Paul and because I'm a crap, flyer kind of insisted on turning left on the airplane and when I got to Los Angeles the first thing I said to Paul is mate I'm so sorry that flight cost us eight Albions as if it was a unit of currency that we were soon to run out of. I think convincing ourselves that we were soon going to run out of customers was in a funny way us comforting ourselves that as composers we didn't have the competition we've since found out that we have. One thing that Spitfire has taught me is that we're not really in that kind of competition. There's very little match fixing or doping, dirty tricks. We're not uh, sticking our feet in each other's spokes. Now I see composition more as like golf, where you're only really competing with yourself. And what's good about golf, as an example, is if you go to the lengths that Tiger Woods has gone to, say since he was six years old, it's likely you'll become Tiger Woods. There are always variables, there's always the unexpected, but we're working within a craft form. It's less subjective than becoming an artist, becoming the next Coldplay. It's quite difficult vlogging with a tempestuous Cocker Spaniel trying to bite your ear off. And when I'm talking about Tiger Woods and what he has done to achieve what he's achieved, it's not just being good at golf and practicing. You know, he has at points had to go out there and get sponsorship. He's been charismatic. He is good at marketing himself. I imagine he presses the flesh often. And for the support structure around him, I imagine he's a good collaborator. I'll stop the golf analogy. I think that, you know, to be a successful composer requires more than just being good at composing. Someone said to me the other day with the media composition that it's 50% lunch. My interpretation of that is firstly we need to find our voice actually correction I think it's all about playing to our strengths I always cite Beyonce here our queen is she the greatest singer ever to have lived no she's an extraordinary talent an extraordinary artist I would say that she doesn't have a particularly broad range I don't think she has the chops of say Mariah or Aretha and her tone of her voice, it's, it's hardly rich and chocolatey. So she's decided not to become a jazz singer, a, a soul diva, or indeed an opera singer. She's just Beyonce. Secondly, we need to be a really good people person. We have to empathize with who we're working for and with. We have to be able to delegate. We have to be uh, kind of administratively minded amongst the people that we employ, whilst also being sympathetic to the needs of our employers. We need to kind of outwork work the next person, make huge sacrifices, which is why I always recommend it's kind of a young person's game to get into initially, when your body can withstand the slings and arrows of outrageous composition. And indeed, before we have families, if you do have a family, children of your own, you're probably not gonna see much of them if you're forging a career in composition. We need to, in this day and age, be effective marketeers. And I know a lot of people get incredibly frustrated by other composers who achieve success by being so effective at marketing. They're simply running their business better than you, and that's the final thing. You've got to see what you do as a business, and it's all of those things. It is the business plan, it is the marketing plan, it is the, the direction of focus. I was at the Ivan Novella Awards this uh, last week, 
and it was the second time uh, in a row that my brother and his partner Alexis had been nominated for best computer game score this year it was for Assassin's Creed and what was so kind of proud for me as a brother to be in that room was that that is the one day of the year where composers, songwriters, authors, as in lyricists, get together and let their guard down, get very emotional about actually how hard it is to do what we do well and how hard it is to get to a stage where you've touched enough people to be recognised by your peers. I think that what Alexis and Joe have done is absolutely play to their strengths to a point where they're untouchable, in my mind, compositionally. It's just totally them, whilst also having a laser focus on the end goal. So I'm not circling around the question. I'm basically uh, putting a kind of, I would hope, a hopeful and realistic preface on what you may find to be some pretty alarming news. Now, attending NAM, I get the impression that the marketplace for musical instruments, music tech, is uh, roughly the population of, between the population of England and the population of the UK as a whole. So, population of England is about 55. If you add Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, it ratchets up to 65. Now, I believe this is open knowledge. Apple claimed that there are 20 million legal users of Logic Pro X. So we can imagine there's probably a considerable number of garage band users also. So that's a pretty staggering sum. In the UK, there are 50,000 people registered either as employed or self-employed musicians. And of a poll of, I think, about 10,000 musicians in the United States, about 5% of people who call themselves musicians actually make a living out of it. Now, I'm speaking in the very general rock, pop, dance, and our line of work. That whole umbrella within the dance, pop, EDM arena, you're dealing with a lot of people who are not only wanting to be good at what they do, great and successful in their profession, they're also wanting to be rich and famous. The good news for us as composers is we're, we're operating within a niche. Often we're the people who love making music but hate the idea of being famous. Rich, but maybe not famous. Uh, another thing you can do is just look at something like LinkedIn to get an impression for our niche corner of the industry. And last time we looked there are 300,000 registered film composers on LinkedIn. You can assume that there are a lot of people who are wanting to be professional film composers on LinkedIn but it is LinkedIn. You're not gonna say you're a film composer where actually you're trying to get work as a lorry driver. It's a recruitment tool. So to answer you candidly, Arp Quadra, my estimation based on a whole bunch of stuff that I've kind of been mulling over, I think there's probably half a million people who are either working as film composers, training to be film composers, or aspiring to be film composers. And I reckon less than 5% of that 500,000 are actually earning an independent living from that, i.e. a living that can support themselves without having to take on any other work. And I guess that's the interesting question. You know, what qualifies you being a film composer? In my mind, it's having written some music for films. An ability to create a successful business out of that is a different matter being successful as a film composer particularly a film composer these days is very very difficult to earn money doing that but what it can do is earn you a certain degree of credits credits in the bank respect and dare I say a bit of power and it's down to your entrepreneurial spirit how to utilize that whether that's setting up a YouTube channel that sells mugs to your fans I don't know you know you look at Manchester United do they make all of their money from being a successful football team? No, they sell a lot of strips too. What's his name, that hairdresser? Clark, he's one of the biggest earners in Britain. Is that from hairdressing? No, it's from selling shampoo. Where composers are concerned, the way that our jobs are structured, we're the printers of the film industry. We're the Hewlett Packards, the, the Epsons. We don't make money out of selling printers. We make money out of selling ink.
So my advice, Arp, and to all of you who are watching, is not to consider other composers to be competition. In doing so, you are kind of turning your back on a brother and sisterhood who's out there to really help you and help each other. No, the greatest competition you have is with yourselves. I think the route to success is to actually understand the odds and to be prepared to undertake them, to invest in yourself as a composer, invest in yourself as a people person, develop and market your own brand, outwork 98% of the people around you and be a good business person are all things that you should consider. But wherever possible, make sure you own the ink that comes out of your pen. And I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Do you consider other composers to be competition? Uh, what, in your understanding, are the numbers of composers that you're up against, so to speak, in uh, the, the part of the world where you live? And of the people you've studied with, how many of them have gone on to be successful? And how are you finding it? As always, thanks for watching. Do subscribe if you haven't done already. There's some very exciting stuff coming up. Ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time I put up a video. It's starting to rain, nice. One of those, always appreciated for efforts made here today by myself, Oscar and B.